Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2023 Southeast Collaborative Conference. It's online, too. My name is Laurie Thompson, and I'll be your host for this session, which is titled Things for Your Collection. This event is sponsored through funding from the Library Services and Technology Act through the Institute of Museum and Library Services. So please feel free to ask questions or make comments in the chat. You can interact with other attendees. And because this is a bonus session, you can address your questions through the Hula app to Shane as we go along. And now I'd like to introduce Shane Plunk from Jackson Madison County Library in West Tennessee, just so you get some idea of where he's from. Shane, uh, I think we're all set for you. Go for it. All right, excellent. So hello, everyone. Um, I will be answering all of your questions in the chat, like Lori said. Um, I am the adult services librarian here at the Jackson Madison County Library. Um, I do a lot of programs. I do a lot of partnerships. And I also work on our adult collection, which includes our library of things. Um, so I really wanted to be able to share that with all of you guys since non-traditional lending is becoming such a big part of our jobs as, you know, library staff and things like that. So this is kind of our brand for our library of things. Um, we thought it was very important to give it a specific graphic to make sure that people could recognize it, something to put on all of our literature about it, when we're promoting it, make sure we have a strong brand and things like that. But let's go into talking about what things are and what the Library of Things is meant to do, especially for our library here in Madison County. So what is it and why do we need it? So the Library of Things or any non-traditional lending items that you may have in your library are primarily because we want to make sure that our patrons have access to check out things that they may not want to own or may not be able to own for some reason or another. Now that could be because they don't have the space for it. Um, there are so many things that we use rarely or just on occasion that we don't want to have room to store in our house. Um, so that's a great use for the Library of Things. Or in the case of us here in Madison County, Tennessee, um, a lot of our patronage may not have the resources in order to get some of those things. So we like to have that. And we also need it because it expands the sharing economy. And this is a term that, you know, a lot of libraries are familiar with from familiar with because it is the basis of what we do every single day and the sharing economy is defined as the ability and or preference to rent and borrow goods rather than to own them or to buy them so people want to read books they don't want to necessarily own every book they read it's the basis of the library so that is why we need the library of things because as we grow our collections as we make sure that we have non-traditional items it's important to make sure we have things that are unique and interesting that not everyone has access to. So another question you may have are what things, what kinds of things do you put in your library of things? If you're doing non-traditional lending, what sorts of criteria do you use to decide what to put in it? And there are a few things that we consider at our library when we're adding to the library of things. The first one is we like to consider things that may be occasional use. So those may be things like seasonal items that people are not going to want to use all the time. If you are checking things out to your patrons that are constantly in use, then you may find that those items are a little bit harder to get back. Um, so things like outdoor games, things like garden tools, uh, 
drills or power tools if you're brave and want to put those in your collections. Um, those are the sorts of things that we consider occasional use, things that are not everyday items that you would need. The next criteria that we have, um, we consider things that are purely recreational. Um, things that might be fun for a little while um, for adults or for kids or for teens, whoever it may be, things that will kind of lose their novelty after a little bit of time so that they will bring them back. We want to make sure that if we're having these things, just like with a book, we'll get them back so someone else can use them. Things like that for us would be our karaoke machine or our telescope, things like that, which will come back after the shine has worn off of that item when they've checked it out. Things that are pricey are really a good one to go for. Um, pricey for us is something in the range of more than $30, less than $150. Um, so again, you want to make sure that the things you're adding into your collection are ones that are a little harder to get a hold of, um, things that may not um, may not be commonplace just because they're expensive. If if you have ever had something, a tool or a kitchen gadget or anything at all that you thought, oh man, I would love to have that, but it's a little out of my price range right now. Those are great candidates for the library of things. So those are definitely things that we consider. And then lastly, we try to do things that are educational. So we have things like a digital microscope. We have a bird watching kit, drawing sets, um, those sorts of things, which ensure that people are getting an educational value out of them are fantastic. Um, though they are not necessarily in the policy for our library of things, we also do learning kits. Those are a great thing that you could add um, to have in your library as well, uh, so that children can have access to books to learn, but also little activities, um, anatomical models and things like that. We have a fossil set so that kids can read about fossils, but also have some examples. Um, those learning kits are a great way to make sure that you have things in your collection that are handy for little kids as well, and they're a great place to start. Just to give you an idea about some of the usage that we have here at our library, we have about 140 things in our library of things. Um, a lot of those are things like cake pans. Those do include our uh, mobile hotspot devices, those go under our library of things policy. We just recently revamped a lot of the library of things and added items back in October of 2022. Um, so it has been interesting to try to rebrand and really push um, the usage of those items. Um, in uh, in the last year or so, we have had about 320 total checkouts um, from our library of things. And with us having 140 items in it, that gives us the turnover of, you know, two uses per item over the course of a calendar year. So all of our things are getting used. Um, about one half of those checkouts end up being our mobile hotspots, um, our MiFi devices especially if your library does not, for some reason, have mobile hotspots for your patrons to check out. That is usually what I have, in my experience, the first thing that a library system will get um, that is a non-traditional item, really, um, aside from things like DVDs and CDs, which have really become more of what people expect a library to have. Um, but mobile hotspots are a fantastic way to kind of get started, um, finding a way to bring the internet to some of your patrons who may not have internet access, 
giving them an amount of time where they can have that in the convenience of their own home without having to come to your library to use the internet or without having to go to McDonald's or a coffee shop, something like that. Um, that's just a, a little bit of background on how our library of things is going. And like I said, as it was recently revamped, we're really hoping to have better numbers even in 2023 for that. So policies are where it gets a little more difficult. And you have to be a little specific, of course, and you have to um, consider some different possible outcomes when you're dealing with your library of things as you would with your books. Um, for us, we developed a separate policy with some different sets of rules that made um, made it a little bit of a learning curve at the beginning um, for our circulation staff. But at this point, it is all just second nature to everyone that works the circulation desk, and it is not a problem at all. So if you have to do some tweaking to procedure to make sure that everything is handled and kind of lines up neatly, then I think your CERC staff will be okay with that. But let me go over what our policies are. First off, we make sure that anyone who checks out a library of things item is 18 years old at least. Um, there are some of the things as far as legality, I'll go into that in a later slide, um, ensuring that the patrons that have the items are using them responsibly, that they are using them properly. We like to make sure that an adult is responsible for the thing that is checked out. When someone comes to check out one of our items, we have them sign a one-year agreement. Um, that really kind of forces them to more carefully read over our policy for checkout on the library of things. And when they sign that agreement, we make a note on their account that says when they signed the agreement. And then we take that paper and scan it and save it into our, um, into our system for later reference, just in case we were to need it. And then, you know, every year, if they come back and we see that it's been a year since they signed an agreement, we have them do a new one just so they can refresh themselves on the policies and make sure that they really know what they're getting into when they check out of one of the things from our library of things. Our checkout limit on a thing is one week. Our library system checks out books for two weeks, typically. Um, everything else, as far as the library of things and even our DVD collection, we typically go for one week. Um, that's just so that we have a better turnover. A week is a good amount of time if you are needing something like a drill or if you borrow a board game. That is usually a decent amount of time to get your use out of it and then ensure that it can move on to the next person without too much of commotion. We do allow one renewal on those rather than two. Um, that is just so that one particular person does not keep a thing for an extended period of time. We limit the amount of things you can check out to three at a time as well, so that someone does not come in and wipe out our collection and take all of our lovely non-traditional items all at once. Um, and then after a thing is returned to us, that particular patron cannot check that same item out within seven days. Um, that keeps, like I said, it keeps the economy flowing and ensures that there is access to all of our materials um, without it getting caught up. There was an example of a patron, um, obviously who I will not name. However, um, he liked to rent out the cordless drill that we had 
And this was back when we first got our library of things. We were very excited about it. And he would check out the drill and he would bring it back and he would check it in and he would check it right back out. And that was not a problem for a while. But then we started to notice that there were people coming in and they would say, do you have the drill? Is it available? And we had to tell multiple people, no, it's not. Would you like to put it on hold? And they just said, no, that's fine. That's okay. Um, and then we would not hear from those patrons about that particular item again. So that was when we realized that we really needed to make sure that someone wasn't keeping items um, longer than they should and allow other people to make sure that they could use them. So here I'm going to lay out a couple of specific lines from our policies. We actually, again, more background, we have a lawyer on our library board, um, and we also regularly consult with our county. Um, our director is very cautious and very to the T. And so when we did the library of things, we wanted to make sure that um, there would be no blowback or any kind of issue. Um, so if you consider non-traditional lending and you start your own library of things, then I do encourage you to reach out to your county lawyer or someone in your um, funding body and see what you might be able to do about this. But just a few little things that we included just in case. The thing may only be used and operated in compliance with the library's policies and manufacturer guidelines. Um, that one feels a little self-explanatory. We didn't want people using, you know, the drill for stuff it wasn't supposed to be used for. Um, felt like a good policy to have in there. The borrower shall not make any modification or alterations to the thing. So, you know, if a tool that we lend out isn't exactly what you were looking for, to stop it from being modified or possibly ruined, we make sure that people don't do that. And then this is a legally binding release waiver, discharge, and covenant not to sue made voluntarily by me on my own behalf. We included that as well um, because at the time when we were first starting the library of things, you know, we wanted to just be absolutely cautious that if somebody used, um, if somebody used something that we gave them uh, and somehow ended up getting hurt while doing construction on their house or remodeling or whatever the case may be, um, that that would not somehow come back on us. That's probably a little, it's a lot of precaution. Um, but again, talk with your board or your funding bodies and double check and see what sorts of policies they may want to include as far as legality. So there is a huge problem of many libraries that are unable to figure out how to budget for their library of things. And we were actually one of those, um, we were one of those libraries. We had a lot of funding in our book line item and we weren't really sure how to go about budgeting for the library of things. So the first time that we um, started the library of things, we looked into grants, which was a fantastic way for us to start with a big collection. Um, we went from having only the mobile hotspots to having probably 50 plus items available for checkout thanks to a grant from the West Tennessee Healthcare Foundation. However, if you are not able to find a grant that will help you fund a library of things, there are other ways you can handle that. The budget for your library of things could or maybe should come out of your normal book line item. Um, starting a library of things is simple as putting some of that money aside in order to purchase things. As long as you're confident that those are items that your community will benefit from, um, oftentimes you will be able to use that kind of 
line item for expanding your collection, and that will include a library of things. Now, this can be difficult for libraries who may only use state or federal funds in order to receive items for their collection. Before I was here at Jackson, I was part of a much smaller library that all of our budget for books came from state and federal funds, and they are very specific about what you can purchase for that. And it was difficult for that particular library to start a library of things. Um, but that is when, again, like I said, you can involve um, your friends group or board. If you have a friends group, if they are willing to sit and discuss with you some of the items that they would like to be able to borrow rather than to purchase, if you can have them hold a fundraiser or try to rally around your library in order to bring those items for borrowing, um, then that's a fantastic way to go about it. And like I said, of course, you can always look into grants. There are grants all over the place um, that are very open to the idea of new and exciting things at the library. So that's just a few ideas for how to get some budgeting for your library of things. I'm going to talk about some of the things that we have so you have some examples. We have a few categories. So I, we have home improvement things. You can see we have an electricity monitor, a thermal leak detector, a laser level, a stud finder, a cordless drill, and a string light repair kit. So all of those things, the drill is definitely the most popular. People check that out all the time. It is constantly checked out. Um, but all of those things, you can see how if you have someone moving into a new home that you know, they've already spent a bunch of money purchasing a house. If they instead would want to come to your library and check some of these things out to do some basic sweeps of their house, to find out where their studs are or to check their electricity, things like that. Um, our home improvement things are great for that. We have outdoor things. We have a bocce ball set, we have a lemonade stand kit, we have golf clubs, we have a bird watching kit, telescope, garden tool set, croquet set, and a four person tent. Um, all of those things are ones that we thought were, again, they fit one of those four parameters of, is it occasional use, is it seasonal, is it educational, recreational, um, but of all of those, the bird watching kit is actually the one that checks out the most. People really enjoy getting the bird watching kit, especially when springtime rolls around. We have educational things. We have a drawing kit that includes a bunch of charcoal mar uh, charcoal pencils um, with the little drawing mannequin. Um, that is one that we have to replace the supplies in somewhat frequently, but as they're a little inexpensive to replace every now and again, we just go for it. We have a stencil set. We have something called the Coda Pillar, which is a great um, toy that kind of teaches different, um, it's a STEM toy uh, with putting the different segments of the caterpillar together. Kids can learn how executing an order of operations works without the complexity of coding. And then, as I mentioned before, in our educational things, we have a digital microscope as well. Um, kind of scary to use that one. Um, sometimes looking at, you know, your skin or hair or whatever is a little, little jarring, but a lot of these we keep in our makerspace um, so that they are freely there to use even for those who don't want to check them out. Um, we like, at our library, we like kitchen things. We are big eaters. We like to cook. 
And so we have a lot of kitchen things. We have a canning kit, a cake ball making set, bread maker, cake pans, pasta machine, Belgian waffle maker, food dehydrator, donut mold, snow cone maker, vacuum sealer, ice cream maker, and a digital kitchen scale. We are definitely the kind of people that love to use these things. Um, the bread maker is fantastic, um, especially while everyone was learning how to make bread back when the COVID pandemic first started. Um, our cake pans, we have about 75 unique cake, cake pans. Um, that makes up a huge, huge portion of our library of things. And we're trying to, again, revamp them and get people to come in and check those out more. We have music things. This one was very interesting to me in particular, um, mostly because so often it is very expensive for people to be able to buy an instrument. Um, and so I think that allowing people to have that creativity, um, it really draws people into the library as a creative making space. Um, but we have a karaoke machine, we have a ukulele, we have a record player, a cassette to digital player, a kalimba, which is the little thumb pianos, and we have a tabletop electric drum set, which I know so many parents are so, so very excited for us to have. Um, we have a lot of tech things. We have a film and slide scanner. So for people who have their negatives from old family photos, um, they can come in and scan those in. We have Chromebooks that people can check out. A lot of libraries allow people to check out laptops and things like that. We went with Chromebooks. We do have the mobile hotspots, like I mentioned. Um, through a grant with AARP, we were able to purchase several Facebook portals to send out to different um, senior facilities so that especially during the height of COVID, people could keep in touch with their families um, when there were either nursing homes or senior care centers that were not allowing families to come in. Um, we have a mobile device, a VR headset, we have an, a car code reader, and we have a video to digital converter for changing all of your lovely old VHSs onto digital files. Very handy stuff. Very expensive stuff. The tech things tend to be on the more expensive side. Um, but we have found that people are typically very, very respectful, especially of the tech things. Then we have what is kind of a miscellaneous category. Um, we have black light bars. Um, we have memory care kits, which I will show off in just a little bit. Um, but we do have those for circulation for people who are experiencing um, dementia um, with different books and activities to help stimulate their brains, but also with lots of information for caregivers. Um, we have a party games kit. We have a travel kit, which is part of the revamping. We have a digital luggage scale and one of the um, converters that you take if you go traveling abroad, you have to have a different kind of plug and things like that. They were separately listed items in our library of things once upon a time, and we decided that because those two didn't circulate particularly well, we would put them together into one kit, which is something I'll go into a little bit later as well. And then we also have a sewing machine um, for people who are interested in learning or people, you know, who just need it for a one-time thing. We have board games, which has been a huge, huge hit. Um, we started off with just a few. We have Disney's Villainous. We got Betrayal at the House on the Hill, Azul, Mysterium, and Pandemic. All of those board games have been circulating so, so well. And I was very hesitant because of losing pieces, but... That's another thing I'll address a little bit later, but highly recommend getting board games for circulation. Patrons really love that because board games are very expensive these days. 
And then I also wanted to include an upcoming list of things that we wanted to get. Every year we kind of look at what we have, what is circulating well, and what we think would be able to circulate even better um, in our community. So our upcoming things, once we hit a new fiscal year, we would love to get an air fryer, a bubble machine, a portable green screen and lighting kit, which could also be used in our maker space so that we can allow people to go up and record things on our green screen, um, a music keyboard, a picnic backpack, a projector and then a VCR because shockingly VCRs are extremely hard to get a hold of nowadays and they are going for a couple hundred dollars on Amazon. So if you know if we've got people that need VCRs, the library should be a good place to come and get one. So one of the things that is the most difficult about maintaining a library of things is deciding how to show off your items. Um, there's a few different ways. You can make space on your current shelving. Now, there are a few problems with that. Um, in order to look neat, you really need to have uniform packaging so that everything will fit and nothing will look totally out of place on your shelves. And if you have, like us, 140 different items in your collection, that can take up a lot of your shelf space. You can also consider shelving your non-traditional items with like materials. And when I say that, I mean taking something like the drawing kit that we have that I showed you that has the mannequin and the charcoal pencils taking one of those items and putting it with the putting it in the seven hundreds and putting it with the other arts books so that people who are already interested in that topic can go right over to the books that they're already predisposed to looking at and seeing hey that's awesome they have this drawing kit right here um those sorts of things are fantastic as far as getting people to come and grab them. You can also use a notebook. At one time, we had a big three ring binder and every single item in the library of things had a page where it had a picture of it and a description and everything like that. So it is quick and easy to look through. We had it at our circulation desk. People could come up and say, hey, can I look at the library of things book? We would hand it right to them and they could flip through it and see very quickly what we had. However, that one we did find it harder to market to patrons because it's not something that is constantly in their view. Um, if you have a notebook with your things and then you have all of your items stored somewhere in the back, it's very hard to get people to understand the real depth of what you have or to even ask for the notebook. So what we decided on was kind of a mixture. We decided to take DVD cases and that way people can see the collection at a glance. So every single DVD case for every single library of things item, we put the title of it, we put our branding on it, we put the picture of the item, and then on the back it tells you the very basic policies of the library of things so that when people come in, they can see on the top of one of our shelves, there are you know several, several DVD cases. Um, excuse me. They can see that we have a cordless drill. They can see that we have a cassette converter so that they can take their cassettes and turn them into digital files. All they have to do is approach that display of DVD cases. <clears throat> And all of them are uniform. They see the pictures. They see exactly what it is that they're getting. The one drawback that we have noticed 
is that sometimes, <laughs> excuse me, sometimes patrons misunderstand what it is that they are looking at. So sometimes people come in and they see the DVD cases and they think they're DVDs. They think they're instructional DVDs on, you know, how to use a stud finder or how to find the studs in your house or um, how to play cricket or croquet. Um, so you have to be a little careful there, but with the right signage, you can make sure that your patrons see everything in your collection just at a glance. Um, regardless of how you go about showing off your collection, just make sure that it's something that works for your patrons. Um, if you decide to display things on your shelves, again, as I explained before, I came from a very small library um, before I worked here in Jackson. And there was a big concern about if we weed too many books, if we follow the weeding guidelines and weed too many books, our shelves will look empty. If instead of worrying about if they looked empty, you took some of your library of things and you shelved them with like materials, then your shelves would look not only full, but you would find yourself circulating a lot of those items just by sitting them near books of that same interest. <laughs> so, one thing that we had to look into quite a bit was how to boost our circulation for the library of things. Um, during the course of the pandemic, we saw a huge drop in our circulation as far as physical items, especially library of things. People did not want to check out anything that they did not have to. So when we started to circulate more, once we saw our numbers go back up, we wanted to make sure that the Library of Things would also see an increase in circulation. So <clears throat> one way, of course, are social media postings. We like to make videos of our staff using our collection. Um, we have done videos of our marketing man manager coming in with a bunch of bananas and cutting them up and putting them on the food dehydrator. And she did a little TikTok of us, of what that process looks like, saying, hey, look at this thing you can check out, and then recorded some of the staff members eating the finished product. Um, that was a really fun one. Um, you can also make sure that you have programs or events that might include the library of things or would kind of lead people into using those. If you have a cooking class and you have a very robust collection of kitchen-based things, then you can make sure that the patrons who attend those events know that they can, at no cost to them, come and check out some of those materials um, to be able to bake bread or to make donuts, or if they don't have a waffle maker, they can have one for a week. Another way is to make good displays, and not just of your library of things in particular, but to pair items from your library of things with your books. If you are doing a display in November of cookbooks for the Thanksgiving holidays, whatever the case may be, then you can put some of your kitchen things out with it. Um, you may be doing some science uh, you may have a display about birds, which you could put a bird watching kit on. There are so many ways that you can tie in your non-traditionally lent items into the displays that you already do to make sure that the people who are stopping to take a look at the amazing things you are already doing, that they can stop and see that, they, that you offer things that they had no idea about. 
possibly my favorite part of making the library of things and trying to boost that circulation is making proper kits out of them. And I'm gonna show you what I mean with that. So when you put together the library of things, this is what we package many of our library of things in, a little clear vinyl bag with a zipper. Um, they have these little metal luggage tags on them that show the barcode, what it is. And inside, we have our contents list. Um, this one is the donut mold kit. It says it has two silicone donut molds, a silicone pastry brush, and the Easy Baked Donut Cookbook. So when you check this kit out, you're getting these two donut molds and you're getting the little spatulas to use with them, the little brushes to use with them. But not only that, if you are completely inexperienced with how to make a donut, then you've got the cookbook right here. You've got the book that tells you exactly how to do it. Um, this is for baked donuts. So it's gonna tell you everything you need to do. You are not going to have to find the thing and then either look up a recipe online or go to the shelf and find more books. Everything is already conveniently packaged for you within the, the thing that you just checked out. Um, so making kits out of your things is a great way to go about it. And then lastly, you can involve your patrons. And that is, as much as I like making kids, that is maybe the most important of the ways that you can boost your circulation. Mostly because if you make sure that you reach out to your community and ask them what sorts of things they would like to have access to that they do not, they will tell you exactly what it is they're looking for. And if there is any way within your library's policy, within your, po your budget, anything like that, if you can make that happen for them, then you will see those items circulate. So it's very, very important to go on social media, to talk to them, to make sure that you are getting things that are useful to your community. Um, I am going to show you all some of the ways that we package our libraries of things. I'm going to go ahead and throw this contact slide up in case you need this. Of course, I am at the time of you watching this, probably in your chat right now, answering your questions. Um, but you can use any of the contact information here to get a hold of me anytime. I do want to go ahead and show off some of our the ways that we package our things here. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and just share with you some of the ways that we package stuff. So I did mention earlier that we do have memory care kits. Um, <clears throat> this is one of the things that I am maybe most passionate about as far as our library of things go. Um, I had a grandmother who had dementia. Um, and so it was very important for me to see that caretakers had access to things. So this in particular, we have five different memory care kits in our library, and this one is remembering pets. And so it comes with a whole stack of little books that is going to help the caregiver that checks the item out um, to give them all kinds of ideas like talking points for engaging. These are gonna have pictures and things to make sure that the person uh, experiencing Alzheimer's or dementia is engaged. All of our memory care kits also include a couple of tactile components, which is really great for engaging their memory. So we were sure to include a little dog um, because it's a pet book, it's a pet kit and this little fidget toy that will keep their hands busy so that they can listen and kind of focus a little more. 
Um, and then there is the dementia handbook, which shows the caregivers how to provide the care for their uh, people experiencing dementia at home. And then we also have lots of little um, suggestions. We have fact sheets. We partnered with the National Institute on Aging to get some of their fact sheets in here. There are resources. Basically, this is an all-in-one inclusive kit to help people who are caregivers to have a very endearing um, moment of connection with whoever it is they might be giving care to. It could be someone that is, you know, it's a client, but it could also be a grandmother or a parent. Um, and so that's one of our favorite things as far as our library of things go. Um, we do also, I have, to, I did show you what our typical packaging is. Um, sometimes you get something that is a little harder to fit into that kind of standard package. This is the four person camping tent. Um, we are very lucky that this came with a nice little bag with it um, so that all it needed was our luggage tag with the barcode and our, our name on it and what it is. Um, luckily, so sometimes you can keep things in their original packaging. And then sometimes we also have very large items, which we have to get a much bigger bag for. We don't have many of these, um, but this one in particular is our um, canning kit. And so within this large bag, you can see that we have a set of canning tools. We have our entire canning pot here with all of the things inside your colander and such. We have the instructions. We always include the instructions that come with any of the things. If we're going to require in our policies that people follow the manufacturer's instructions, we're gonna make sure they have an access, have access to those. Um, and then this also includes two different books on different kinds of canning, um, ways to go about that, recipes, so that that way everyone is knowledgeable about what they're working with. Um, so I also did tell you that our board games are a favorite. And a huge, huge problem that we encountered was figuring out how to ensure that everything was there as far as the pieces. Um, our cataloger really was concerned that some things would get returned incorrectly or not at all. And so we kind of came up with a couple of ideas and I wanted to share those with you just in case you decide to get some board games. Um, one way that you can ensure that your pieces come back is to weigh them. I saw that suggestion that you can get a like a male um, like a male scale um, so that you can weigh exactly how much a board game with all of its components will weigh so that when that's returned, you'll know that all of the all of the pieces have been returned with it as well. Um, we have not quite started doing that. Um, we include a very detailed list on the lid of the board game of the important pieces, and our circulation staff will check it before actually checking the item back in. If anything ends up missing from those sets, as long as it's not something that is vital to the gameplay, um, you know, if it's a game and the board is missing, then we may have to get a replacement. But if it's a game that has 200 cards in it and there's one card missing, then is that game still playable even without the card? Probably so. 
Um, so we will just continue to use them until they're not playable. We've not actually had any issue despite all of our concern about it. Um, all of our board games that have checked out, Knockwood, have returned with all of their pieces, all of their cards. It has not been an issue yet. Um, so that is, that's a couple ways that you can handle that. But I think that overall, um, you should just remember that your library of things, your non-traditional items that you want to start to lend, there are a lot of ways you can go about it. There are, just like the rest of your collection, it will be completely unique to your own library. The things that you will be able to lend are going to all differ from community to community. But it is important that you make sure that these are items that your community will benefit from. Um, and once again, if anyone has any questions about this process, I am more than happy to help. Um, and that will be the end of my presentation. That was awesome, Shane. I, I really like the idea about weighing the, the games. That's interesting. Thank you. Thank you. So we invite you to address your questions to Shane in the Whova app. And... I thank you for being here today with us. There will be in the um, the session resources an evaluation, and we'd like your your feedback about the session as well as the conference as a whole. Thank you, everybody, especially Shane, for making the 2023 Southeast Collaborative Conference a huge success. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a good one.